Hi, welcome to Mr. Marlon's second revision higher physics hangout. I hope your exams have been going very well and I do hope you're getting a good success in your chemistry and your maths which is sat at uh, the beginning of this week and last week. The format for this evening's hangout is the same as a class. I'll give you a few starter questions. Uh, you can read them over for a few seconds and then if you've gone to Edmodo and downloaded the app, uh, downloaded the sheets with the with the questions on it, you can answer questions as you go along. Now I'll be moving now to screen share and we'll be starting the first question. So I welcome all of you to give up this next say half hour, 40 minutes to do a bit of revision. And the good thing about it is you can watch uh, if you want to take part, you can take part. Uh, and the good thing is that the Hangout is recorded, so the link will be available and you can go and you can play back uh, the whole revision lesson uh, anytime you want. So I'm going to say further, uh, nothing further, I'm going to go to screen share. I'm going to take a look at the first question for this evening. And here is the question, a tricky one to begin with, but. Uh, it's easily done. Here we go then, as I go to the first question. And there's the first question. It's all about uh, a trolley travelling along a straight track. And the graph shows how the velocity, V, of the trolley varies with time. So you can see this part here. It starts with a high velocity. Its velocity is reduced. And then, of course, after T1, we see that the line continues down. Your job would be to draw the acceleration graph for this motion. Now, the key point here to remember is that an acceleration time graph is just really a graph of the gradient of the velocity time graph. So if you know the gradients, you can easily draw the velocity time graph. Here it goes. So if I drag out my graph, that's the question that you should have. That's the answer you should have, rather. Let's see how we get that answer. Well, we can see from this part of the graph, if I highlight it, we have a negative acceleration. So the first part of the graph, up to T1, should be drawn like that. And then quite suddenly, at T1, the graph becomes less steep. It has a less gradient than this one. So the acceleration of that part of the graph should be this one here. The little big one up here just shows you that it changes at T1. So that should be the graph you should have if you've done that first little starter question. It's all to do with gradients. This part of the graph here is a negative gradient, so you have to go below the line, draw the constant acceleration, and then at T1, the gradient becomes less. So the value of acceleration will be less. Therefore, the line will be a little bit higher up, which means let more towards the zero line. So that's a very tricky one. What we got to remember from that question? Well, there we go. Short corner. The gradient of a velocity time graph is the acceleration. And you can see... Uh, by doing this little problem here, there's a velocity time graph. And you can see the first part of the graph, the gradient is positive. So therefore that will translate as that there. Then you have this part of the graph, constant velocity, zero gradient. So you'll have no acceleration. And then finally, you have this part of the graph here, which goes down, negative gradient. Uh, and therefore, we have to draw it like that. The wee bit at the end means the data has stopped. So, the big thing for this question is you have to remember that the velocity time graph, the gradient of it, is the acceleration. Now, what about this famous one here you get asked? Now, let's look at this for a second. It starts with a high velocity, and the velocity is reduced to zero, and then it continues all the way down to here. Now, what would be the corresponding acceleration time graph for that particular motion? 
Uh, can we guess what type of motion that is? Yeah, it's something to do with the a ball being thrown into the air, leaves the hand at a high velocity, rises up to its maximum, and then falls all the way back down, accelerates all the way back down. Now, the key point to remember for that graph is there's just one acceleration. Check it with your roller. If you've got a roller on you, just check that's the one slope. So therefore, the corresponding acceleration time graph will look like that. Starting from here, the acceleration, the, the velocity is decreasing, 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 and therefore it's got a negative gradient, and therefore it's just a one gradient. So that's why we have the line going across here like that. That's a good question to learn because it fills quite a lot of people. This graph up here has got one acceleration, and another acceleration, whereas the ball being thrown into the air just undergoes one type of acceleration, this one here, represented by the line going along the axis here. In fact, if it's a ball flung into the air, thrown into the air, sorry, you'll get a value here of minus 9.8 meters per second per second for that value. Okay, so that's a good one to learn, uh, a good one to study. Okay, I'm ready for our second starter question of the evening. Uh, what will it be? Here goes. It's an internal resistance question. We have a cell, a battery, sorry, of 12 volts. And inside the dotted line, you know that represents we're going to have an internal resistor of 2 ohms here. Outside the circuit, we have a 6 ohm lamp and an ammeter. So, what do we do then? This is a battery's internal resistance of 2 ohms and EMF 12 volts. And the first part of the starter question is you have to calculate the ammeter reading. Okay? And if you've done that problem, you would have the following written down the value of the current I flowing in the circuit is equal to the EMF of the circuit divided by the total resistance. And remember, the total resistance includes 6 ohms here and 2 ohms here. So you have to include the internal resistance. So the current flow in the circuit will be 12 volts divided by 8 ohms. And if you do that in your calculator, you should get uh, the following answer, 1.5 amps. So, 1.5 amps flows through the circuit. Now, you know what's going to come next. Find the lost volts. Where do we find the lost volts? We find the lost volts in the internal resistor. That's where the energy is dropped across the internal resistor. So, all I do as I make a little arrow and I put down all the values I know. In this particular case, uh, I have the following. I'm after V, the lost volts. I know I can find the current and I know the value R. So if I put those into the little equation then, I've got V, which I'm after. I is 1.5 amps, which we just worked out. And the internal resistance is 2 ohms. So therefore, I can say that the lost volts is equal to 3 volts. Okay, lost volts will become equal to 3 volts. The last part of the standard question, what will be the output per the lamp? Well, for the lamp here, once again, I have to put down all the things that I know about the lamp, V, I, and R. I do know the resistance of it, 6 ohms. I do know the current going through it, 1.5 amps. And I do know the voltage across it because if the EMF is 12 volts and I've lost 2 ohms, then uh, I've lost 3 volts, sorry, then the terminal potential difference of voltage available at the terminals is going to be equal to. Uh, 9 volts, so we're going to have 9 volts. I've got a full set of numbers. I'm asked to find the output power. So how do I find output power again? I can use the equation P 
equals VI. I know the voltage dropped across it is 9. I know the current flowing through it is 1.5 amps and therefore I can get the power and the power is equal to, do the simple calculation, 13.5 watts. Okay, so that's how you do that particular question here. It's a standard internal resistance question. Now I'm going to go back to the screen right now to, to see if this works. This, this didn't happen the last time, so if we go back to the screen share and maybe catch some of your questions, uh, I don't think there's any questions on it at the moment. Uh, and if I go back to the screen share again, uh, we can go to the next starter question which is this one here. Ah, it's a diode of some sort. And uh, if I just move this out of the way, you'll see the question. We have a battery connected to a PN junction. We have light shining on it. And we have the junction between the two semiconductors. Now, this is a good, good lesson, a good question to recap our semiconductor knowledge. Uh, we know that an n-type semiconductor, the majority of charge carriers are electrons. And in the p-type semiconductor, the majority of charge carriers are holes. So with this particular setup, we have to be very careful how the battery is connected. And if I can just look up here, that's the plus side of the battery, and that's the minus side of the battery. So in this particular case, the electrons are going to move in that direction around the circuit and the holes are going to move that way. And what's going to happen is you're going to have like a parting of the red, the, the, the red sea here. The electrons move one way, the holes move another way. And if I can replace that diagram with this one, you can see we're going to have a depletion layer. The depletion layer is a place where there's going to be no charge carriers. So in this particular case, we have the following. We have the diode is working in reverse bias. The n-type semiconductor connected to the plus. The p-type semiconductor connected to the minus. It's reverse bias. And because of that, you'll have a depletion layer, a small area in the diode where there'll be no charge carriers. Now what, which mode is this diode working on? Well, it's to do with light, so therefore it must be a photodiode. So that's the first thing we have to know. It's a photodiode. And we're also asked to find which mode is it working in. Now because there's reverse bias, uh, it's got to be in photoconductive mode. photoconductive mode. It's in photoconductive mode. Now usually in photoconductive mode when it's reverse bias, uh, no current will flow once we have the parting of the uh, electrons and the holes. But there's still a tiny little leakage current which take place due to the fact that heat liberate some of the electrons and they can sort of kind of swish around the circuit. So there's a tiny leakage current in that one as we call it. Now what happens when the irradiance of light and the diode junction is increased? Well in this particular case then if light lands on the junction, the photons land on the junction and the photons produce electron hole pairs. So the photon landing on the junction photon on the junction produces electron hole pairs. Now that's the key electron and hole pairs. So in this junction here you're going to have electrons produced and holes produced. And the more light is shown on a junction, the more electrons, the more holes, the more electrons more holes. So what happens now? Well because you've got an increase in the amount of charged carriers in there, 
the leakage current is increased. So in this particular case we have a photodiode working in photoconductive mode which means when light shines on the junction electron hole pairs are produced and this will increase the very small leakage current which will register on the ammeter. So we're detecting light. When light shines on it we have a current flowing and the more light it shines on it the bigger the current flows and that is a great uh, use of one of these photodiodes in photoconductive mode. So a wee quick recap on that one. When light shines on the junction as more light falls on the depletion layer more electron hole pairs are produced and as more electron hole pairs are produced there's more charge carriers in the junction which means an increase in the leakage current. So we have a device which will respond very quickly to light shining on it by producing a current. One to learn and it's always at the end of the paper and it's something which we have to work on with the holes and electrons in the semiconductor material. Okay, so let's move on now to our next starter question. And if I'm going too fast for you, don't worry, you can go back again, you can pause the, the YouTube movie, you can look at the question, you can answer it, and then you can see if you got it right by doing, uh, by following my, my workings. Okay, next starter question coming up, what will it be in this evening of revision for the higher physics exam, what will it be? Ah, it looks a good one. This is something to do with refraction of light and it'll take a few minutes to maybe look at that diagram and to sort of like suss out what's happening. I'll just check the screen right now to see if people are maybe asked a question. Uh, to see if someone's asked a question on it, I'll go back to there. Uh, we've got two viewers. Uh, so remember, we can play this back later on at your own leisure, and you can watch uh, how the questions uh, are done. Okay, take a look at this one. We have a tank of water. We have a laser beam entering through the tank, and there's a little mirror placed here, and the mirror will reflect the light up towards this part of the, the water here. And what we see happening is that the refracted ray is not coming out the water. So we can almost say that we are at the critical point. This is the critical angle of this water. The ray of light comes in, strikes the mirror, and comes up here. And this angle here is what we have to find. And we now know because the ray of light does not come out, it's got to be the critical angle. And if we look up our data book, we know that the critical angle is given in the following formula. Sine theta critical is equal to 1 upon the refractive index. So the refractive index of the material is 1.33. So it's 1 divided by 1.33. And if we do the calculation for that, we get sine theta critical is equal to uh, do the calculation 0 0.752 and therefore the critical angle has got to be equal to if we do the calculation 49 degrees so it looks a complicated problem but we just take our time and we're higher physics students so you just take your time and see what's happening the ray of light comes in strikes off the mirror the mirror reflects light up to here, the ray of light doesn't come out, that is your hook. If the ray of light, the refracted ray, does not come out of the water, it must mean that this angle in here is the, ref is the critical angle. And you go straight to your uh, notebook, straight to your data book, sorry, get the formula for the critical angle, 1 upon the refractive index, work out 1 divided by 1.33, and then you get the critical angle is 49 degrees. And that's how that one is done. Now, beware of the Foxy last two mark question on this. Uh, there could be a question that says, what would happen if the refractive index of the material is increased? Would 
the refractor, would this ray of light come out then? Now, that's a very difficult problem to do. Really, what you have to think about is changing your refractive index to higher value. And just do the calculation again and see what the critical angle becomes for the new liquid. So we change the liquid to another one with a higher refractive index. Just choose the refractive index to be 1.44 and do the same calculation again, sine theta critical. We can change it to make it easier and make it 1.5, say. The new refractive index, 1.5, bigger refractive index. Do the calculation again and you'd find out that the critical angle this time becomes equal to 42 degrees. So, the new liquid, the critical angle is 42 degrees. This angle is not going to change. It's going to be much bigger than 42 degrees. So really, you'll get total internal reflection. So just be aware of that one. That's the sort of, kind of thing that may add on to that exam that may add on to your question uh, regarding working out a problem like that. Okay, quite a tough wee start of question that one, but hopefully when you play it back again, you can see what happens and you can see the logic of uh, when we start to change the water to another liquid of a bigger refractive index, we just do the same calculation again, a bigger refractive index, get the new critical angle. This angle is not going to change, we just worked out in the previous example, so therefore the ray of light will be ref totally internally uh, reflected, total internal reflection. Good question, we do that, you're doing really quite well. Okay, let's push on now in this revised higher revision evening. Uh, we go back to uh, our next starter question. I wonder what it's going to be this time. Done a bit of fraction. Let's go. Ah, that's a famous one. It's the pressure, volume, temperature, data uh, relationship. You have got to find the relationship between pressure and data. Uh, that's the experiment we do in the class. Members of any messy experiment, we have a flask of fixed mass of gas. Inside the flask, we have a thermometer measuring the temperature in degrees Celsius. And at the top, we have some electronic pressure sensor which leads into the computer. We have a stopper and we have a bath of water. The bath of water must completely cover the, the flask so that the gas in the flask is heated uniformly. So make sure that's in the diagram. You could ask you what's wrong with the experiment and you have to say things like the water doesn't cover the flask uh, or the thermometer is in the water rather than in the gas. So be aware of that. That's a standard note uh, learning problem. But back to this one here. It says using all the data obtained, and that's a very important one, using all the data obtained. Find the relationship between pressure and temperature. Now the big problem students have with this is where do you start? And the clue is, start in your data book, where you have this relationship in your data book. You have P, V, over T is equal to a constant. They won't give you the standard equation P1, V1, over T1, equals P2, V2, over T2. They'll just give you in that form there. Now, that is your clue. You've got to work out the relationship between pressure and temperature, but remember that only works for the Kelvin scale. No other temperature scale, the absolute Kelvin scale that works for. So if I go to my set of data, and I hope you can see it in the screens, it's quite small, I can find the pressure is 100 and the temperature is 288. So that relationship should be pressure divided by the temperature in the Kelvin, and it should give me a constant value. So all I have to do is to go through each particular set of data in turn, 100 divided by 288, and I just go through each one in turn, uh, 100 for the pressure, just leave out the kilopascals a unit, divided by temperature 288. Go to the next column, 105 divided by 303, it's that easy, 1110 divided by 318, 116 divided by 333, three, three. and finally 121 divided by 348, 121 divided by 348. It's the easiest question in your higher 
you get your calculator out and you just go through the calculations 100 divided by 288 gives you something like 0 0.347 the next value gives you 0 0.347 so you're laughing you have got the first two I definitely show the relationship pressure divided by temperature in the Kelvin is equal to a constant 1110 over 318 gives you 0 0.346 but it's okay it's within our limits uh, 116 divided by 333 is going to give us 0 0.348 and finally 121 over 348 is going to give us 0 0.348 now I can see very clearly that to two decimal places it's almost 0 0.35 so I can write down then pressure the relationship is pressure divided by temperature in the Kelvin scale is equal to a constant 0 0.35 and that's me proved the relationship and you know it's a really good question to do you just look at the experiment maybe answer a few questions on the experiment itself use all the data which means you've got to use that 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 and that to show that you're definitely getting a kind of constant value a good question to do one of the best questions you can hopefully get in the higher and be ready because it could be saying something along the lines uh, of an experiment with with uh, with volume and temperature. And you would do the same thing again. Go to the data book, p view over t is a constant. And you concentrate this time on volume divided by temperature. Or it could be pressure against volume experiment. And in this particular case, it would be p v equals a constant. So at this time, you'd multiply the pressure by the volume table. Uh, uh, entries into the table and you would come out with a constant as well so that's what you get for that one remember the graph of this as well is a very famous questions which always ask you about the graph of this remember you always can get asked uh, one way or the other uh, what is the pressure uh, te pressure temperature if it's going to be in Celsius and remember in Celsius it does something like that the graph it's not going through the origin and this is where our famous Lord Kelvin came in and Lord Kelvin says look I'm going to extend this axis away back to here and therefore I'm going to have the line going through an origin of my choice and the origin of Lord Kelvin's choice corresponded to minus 273 which we now know as 0 Kelvin 0 K O K so that's a good question to study search the past papers for very similar ones like that and you know the technique now to go and solve it okay that's us done the pressure volume and temperature type question which could be asked let's move on now to see what the next starter question could be now once again don't worry if I'm going a bit too fast for you uh, that will be recorded it will be on YouTube there'll be a link to it and you can find, play it back at your own leisure. You can stop the question, uh, do it in a bit of paper, and then see if your answer is correct or not. I'll just go back to the big screen again to see uh, what the situation is uh, here. Uh, we've still got two viewers. Welcome, the two of you. Uh, I don't know who you are, right enough, but hopefully you are enjoying this Google revision, higher physics uh, hangout. So I hope it's helped you a good bit. Remember, the rest of the class can catch up with the YouTube version of it. Let's go to our next starter question uh, and oh yes it's this one here it's a classic one let's have a quick read at this one to see how this one pans out. It's to do with the train crashing into the buffer and it's asking you to calculate the change of momentum and after that you know what's going to come next change of momentum the hook is if you know the time of the collision you can work out the average force so here we go then the first thing to do is it says find the change of momentum and like all these questions you've got to be organized um, you can do this question in parallel with me at the moment if you're watching live on the screen uh, I always have a wee table with momentum before um, before whatever happens here and of course momentum after uh, I do a wee diagram showing what happens before and after. Momentum, tell the examiner 
we know is equal to P equals MV, momentum, mass times the velocity. So this particular case, momentum on the train before the collision, everything to the right is positive, is going to be 3,000 times 5, which has got to be 15,000 units of momentum, kilogram, meter per second to minus 1. After the collision, the train is brought to a halt, it stops, and momentum must be zero. So there's the total momentum before the collision, uh, 15,000 kilograms meter per second. There's the total momentum after the collision. So what is the change in momentum? Now, be careful. You've got it all set up. Change of momentum of this chain. Change of momentum is equal to momentum after. I'll just write down mom after. Take away momentum before. Okay, fill in the numbers. And we have momentum after zero. Take away 15,000. And stick with the maths. The maths is very important. The maths comes out well in the end. The change of momentum then I can write down as follows. Change of momentum. Change of momentum is equal to minus 15,000 kilograms meter per second. What does that mean? It means it's lost 15,000 kilograms uh, meter per second worth of momentum. And that's how easy it is to do the first one. The key point there is to be organized. Lots of people muck up the change momentum as they fail to put in momentum before and momentum afterwards. So be careful. Make up a little table, do your momentum calculations, and then work out momentum after, take your momentum before, and you get minus 15,000 kilograms meters per second to minus one. Now the next part of the question leads on from that. It says calculate the average force given to the train by the buffer. Now we know then that the average force is linked to the impulse. We know the key concept here is that the change of momentum, change of momentum is equal to the impulse. Change of momentum is equal to the impulse. Okay, and when you work out the change of momentum, change of momentum is going to be minus 15,000. We'll just leave out units for the moment. Uh, and the impulse we can write down as FT. Impulse is a force applied over a given time. Now we're told that the whole collision uh, takes place in three seconds, so therefore I can go straight ahead and find the average force. F equals minus 15,000 divided by the three seconds of the time. So the force becomes equal to minus 5,000 newtons. Now why the minus sign? Well the minus sign means quite simply that uh, the force that stopped the train uh, was actually in that direction. And that's pretty obvious when you think about it in real life. To stop the train, there must be a force in the opposite direction. And that's why we have the minus 5,000 newtons. So that's a very good problem to solve because they'll always ask you one or the other to work out a change of momentum and to work out the average force uh, applied uh, in, the, in the collision to bring the object to a stop. Be careful. The minus sign just simply means that the force is in the opposite direction. And that's a key equation in physics. The impulse is a change of momentum. When you come to a halt, your change of momentum is fixed if you're going at a certain speed. What can change is the time it takes you to come to a halt. And that is the big important thing, the time it takes you to come to a halt. If the time is long, your average force will be small. That's what you want. If you're brought to halt very quickly, your average force is very high to equal the change of momentum. So therefore we don't want that because big forces actually kill people and either break their bones. So we don't want that. So that's a good question to remember. It's all to do with change of momentum and impulse. Change of momentum equals the impulse. Okay, let's look at our next starter question then for this evening. Doing quite a lot of starter questions. We're now running 35 minutes into our revision.
But remember, you can go back and you look at it again, and you can make sure you can do the problems, uh, and then you can maybe contact me through Edmodo if you uh, want to ask further questions. Okay, let's look and see what's happening next time. Here's our next starter question. I'll give you a few seconds to, to look at it. It's an energy level question. And it's telling us that an electron makes a transition from this energy level to this energy level. And we know that it will emit a photon and the energy of the photon will be exactly equal to the energy gap. So we now know that energy E from the photon is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of the photon. But it's asking me about the wavelength of the photon, so I have to change this equation to, to work out the wavelength of things. And we know that uh, from the frequency, we know that energy is equal to hc upon lambda. Uh, where do we get that c and lambda upon? Well, we know that the frequency uh, is really equal to the speed of light divided by the wavelength. And that's why we can go from there, frequency, to c divided by lambda. Why do we change the v for speed to c? Because c is the speed of light and it's special. And that's why it's called, uh, given the symbol, c. So we can go from there, hf, to the energy equals eight C upon lambda. And for higher students, it's an easy step to go and work out what the wavelength is. You cross multiply H C and therefore wavelength lambda is equal to H C divided by the energy. So we're really there ready to go. Uh, we know the Planck's constant H has got to be equal to 6.63. To look up the data book, it will be given the data book. 6.63 times 10 to minus 19. It's a funny unit, GS, joule seconds. And we know the speed of light C equals 3 uh, times 10 to the power 8 meter per second. So we've got H and C. And next we have to work out the actual energy gap. What is the energy gap between these two energy levels? Now, you might see the minus signs in front of the energy levels. Do not fall into the trap. The minus sign only tells you that if you have electrons sitting here, you need 21.8 times 10 to minus 19 joules to escape. If you have electrons sitting here, you need 5.4 times 10 to minus 19 joules to escape. And we talk about escaping the atom, we talk about the ionization energy level. In fact, real physicists don't actually think of these energy levels. They think of the electron being in what we call a well. So if I draw a well at that, and there's the ground, and there's some poor wee guy here climbing out the well, there he is trying to climb out the well, then at that energy level, he is just that height short of getting out. This guy here, who's maybe at the very top, he is just needing the minimum of energy to escape out of the well, and that's called the ionization level. So up here is called the ionization level. So to work out the energy gap, it's a very simple technique. Take the big number, 21.8 times 10 to minus 19 joules. And take away the smaller number, 5.40, 5 5.40 uh, times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And if you do that in your calculator, you'll get the energy gap, which is there. So if I do that very quickly, let's calculate it in the, uh, on the desk here. You have 21.8, 21.8, take away 5.40, and you're left with 16.4. Energy gap is 16.4 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So that is the energy gap which you're dealing with. All you have to know to work out the wavelength of the photon, go to your formula here, which we just worked out. Lambda equals hc upon e. And just fill in the numbers. And nothing could be easier. So the wavelength will be equal to the gap uh, this number here, it's, uh, h times c, sorry, uh, which has got to be uh, 
each time C, uh, Planck's constant, which is going to be 6.63, times 10 to minus 19, Planck's constant, multiplied by the C, speed of light, 3 times 10 to the power 8. Okay, do that at the top, once you've got HC, and you're going to divide by the energy gap, which is worked out now, 16.4 times 10 to minus 19. It's just arithmetic on the calculator, and you should end up with a wavelength of about, what, 1.21 or something? 1.21 times 10 to the minus 7 of a metre. Okay. So that's how you do that kind of question. There's only one slip up in this question. It's going from E equals HF to E equals HC upon lambda, and then lambda is equal to HC upon E. Planck's constant, 6.63, speed of light, 3 to the power 8. And the only other thing that slips people up is the energy gap, working out the energy gap here. Go big number, forget the minus signs, go big number, take away small number, and we get an answer. Okay, so that's us for uh, the energy level diagrams. Let's see if there's any more standard questions. We're coming to the end of our uh, revision night. So let's see if we've got another one. Oh, yes, we've got this one here. It's a surefire giveaway. Which of these nuclear reactions is a spontaneous fission reaction? Uh, a, B, C, D, or E. I'll give you something to think about. I'll check to see who's... Uh, on, if anybody's want to sort of ask any questions, still two viewers here. I don't see any questions being asked, uh, or you can maybe put some. Uh, I, I don't know how to get the chat on this uh, to see if some people maybe put in some sort of kind of uh, uh, chat by uh, sentences and that. So I'm not sure what you're saying. But anyway, we'll go back to our big screen now and look at this one. Uh, which of these nuclear reactions is a spontaneous fission reaction? Now remember, in shorthand, spontaneous fission means you're going to have a big nucleus, if I can find a big circle, there we go here, you're going to have a big nucleus, and spontaneous means it's just going to go, so it's going to go into two smaller ones, two smaller nuclei, like that, and like that, with some neutrons given off. So we're looking for a reaction, a spontaneous fission reaction, where the large nucleus itself is on the left hand side and on the right hand side two smaller nuclei plus the, the neutrons. So let's go for each one in turn. Oh you can't have that one because that's a neutron which is causing that split. So that's not the correct one. This one here is a probably a small nuclei adding with another small nuclei to give us uh, a bigger nuclei here, what's not fission, so we can get rid of that one. That one's very similar, it's like a fusion reaction. This one here's a radioactive decay one, because we've got radium going into uh, radon and it's giving off an alpha particle, so it might not be that one. So let's see, well, we'll maybe, maybe we can maybe miss one out here, let's go back again and see if we can, we can figure this out then. Uh, we're looking for a spontaneous fission reaction. Uh, Mm, it looks like this one here. That looks like a spontaneous fission reaction. Yep, that's the one here because it's just one big nucleus here and it's given off two smaller nuclei, even though that one's a lot bigger. So, yeah, that's quite a tricky one, that one. It's got to be this one here because we'll get a large nucleus, large nucleus, split up to give us two nuclei, two small ones. Well, we can argue uh, we'll get a kind of bigger one here and a smaller one here. So, that's the correct answer for that one. Very tricky one now. Uh, just watch out for that question. Good job we did this one. So that is the answer for that starter question there. Okay, we're nearly finished uh, this tutorial. Uh, on to the last question. And I can't leave this uh, second Google Hangout without the capacitor question, which is a really good question to do. If you can do the capacitor questions, you really can pick up marks. And there's the standard uh, question We'll be looking out for a, a capacitor. In this circuit, sketch the graph of current with time when the switch is closed. Give a value for the maximum current. Now, the story of the capacitor, well, close the switch. Electrons rush onto the plate of the capacitor. And, of course, other electrons move away from the other plate of the capacitor. They sense them coming. So, initially, you're going to get a big rush of current. And then as the electrons build up here, 
they're going to repel the other electrons coming from the cell. So they'll kind of hold those ones back. So the picture is this. When you close that switch, an uncharged capacitor, initial big rush of electrons, and then slowly the rush fades away. Now we can represent that in a graph. And here's a graph here. We can put up currents and we can put time. Time and current. So initially we have a large amount of current flowing when it's initially switched on. And then as time goes on, the current decreases because the charge in the capacitor plate is opposing any other charge appearing and therefore the current will decrease. So that's the classic graph of how the current varies when you switch on that capacitor. Give a value for the maximum current. Well, there's only two things we can find in that circuit. 12 volts, 500 ohms. So we go back to our Ohm's law equation and we know that the current I is equal to the EMF V divided by the resistance of the circuit, which is 12 divided by the resistance, which is 500. So 12 divided by 500. And what answer do we get for that for the current? We get 0 0.024 ohms. 0 0.024 amps. Sorry, I think I said ohms there. 0.024 amps. So if we're asked to label that, that's 0 0.024 amps. Well done. The other question you could ask for this circuit, I think you're all quite good at this, is very simple indeed. Find the graph of the voltage across the capacitor as you close the switch. Well, it's the same idea. Uh, as the charge builds up, so will the potential difference across the capacitor. So we're looking at the voltage this time. I'm looking at the time. Then on you go. What will the graph look like as the charge builds up on the capacitor plates? Plus charges here is the left. Negative ones leave. Okay, you think you could answer? Correct. It's a voltage which builds up slowly and then levels off and then stops building up because you have now reached the potential difference across the capacitor has become equal to 12 volts, the potential of the battery. And therefore, no current will flow because it's opposed to two, uh, the, the capacitor and the battery are almost like two single batteries opposing one another. So the voltage potential difference across the capacitor rises up and then comes to a kind of sort of like level out at the voltage of the supply. Now these are the two questions which uh, deal with a capacitor which you should know and make sure you learn. Well that brings us to the end of this revision here. I now try to get back to uh, the picture on the screen. Uh, if I go back to the uh, Google hang out, hangs out screen, sorry, hang out screen, uh, and go off screen share, uh, and I'm back on to the to the webcam in the little physics office here. Good to see two viewers there. Uh, I think if you press that button, I get I get chat thing. No, nope, nobody's asked a question on that one. Then that's okay. Now remember, you can go back and you can view the video uh, of this revision hangout uh, on YouTube. And you can stop when the questions are uh, starting. And you can start when you've done the questions on your piece of paper. And you can check whether you've got them all right or not. Okay? Well, I hope you've done quite well this week, Google Hangout broadcast. Uh, good to see two people joining us. Uh, maybe more of you will watch the, the YouTube video. And uh, if you want more of these, uh, I'll run one on the weekend. And definitely one before the exams next week. Please come in for the exams. Uh, please come into the school and even if you sit in the class or sit somewhere else and do some past papers, at least you'll be you have access to me or Mr. Hare or Mr. Kirkwood to give you uh, help in getting through your revised getting through your, your your revision for your higher exam. Okay, we've had uh, 50 minutes of me giving you a tutorial in the house. This is the way forward. Uh, I wish you all the best. Get back into school and let me know how this Google Hangout uh, worked out for you and any suggestions to change in the future. So for Mr. Marlon and his second Google Hangout, uh, 
I'll see you in school or I'll see you at the next Google Hangout. And if you've got some exams in between, then best of luck.